Okay. Last day we used a peanut butter sandwich to talk about operational definitions in science. And we decided that an operational definition was a recipe or a list of, of steps, a very specific list of steps that would allow us to create the thing we were defining or to measure the thing that we were uh, defining. Now, we're going to use that idea of an operational definition to build some of our foundational ideas in kinematics. For example, you are here, but where is here? It's three in the morning, it's dark, you're a little bit afraid, it's kind of a sketchy neighborhood. You find a phone booth. Work with me here. In the olden days, we used to have phone booths because we didn't have cell phones. You're in a phone booth, you're calling your friend, and you say, come get me. Your friend says, where are you? What's the first thing you want to tell your friend? Brave soul, raise your hand. Okay, look for a street sign or some sort of a, a, a reference point that your friend would recognize. You, you, know, you know that market over there on 3rd Street? Well, I'm just down the road from that. Okay, so we need to, we need to agree on some reference point. And then, once you have a reference point that you can agree on, you tell them how to get to you from that reference point. You know, go three blocks uh, east, two blocks north. Um, we can also describe that uh, with a vector. And we typically label that vector R, with a little vector sign on top indicating it's a vector quantity. <coughs> now the name that we give that is position. Now, Arnold Aaron, one of the founders of the field of physics education research, feels very strongly that, first of all, you should have an idea that you just desperately want to talk to everyone about. And then you name it. That's what science is about. My daughter, bless her heart, she's just a, a wonderful uh, mother. She's got four children. She's a biologist. She's just a very accomplished individual. In high school, she got straight A's. And when she'd bring home her, her interim report card from science, it was just a hoot. I mean, it was all A's, but when you'd read it, in this one class, it was Scientific Vocabulary 1A, Scientific Spelling 1A, Scientific Vocabulary 2A, Scientific Spelling 2A. This teacher thought that science was memorizing a bunch of fancy-sounding words and knowing how to spell it. Well, I'm here to tell you that if you don't, if you don't know at least three different ways to spell buoyancy, you're not a scientist. I mean, you don't, you don't become a scientist because you can spell, okay? So you got to have this idea, and you want to talk about it, and then you give it a name. Now, here's the operational definition. You define an origin, draw a vector from the origin to the object. That's it. That's all there is. It's not hard. Now, what if I go someplace else? Well, to define that going someplace else, we can start with our operational definition of position. And we can define an origin. From that origin, we can define a, an initial position and a final position. What we're looking to uh, talk about is this vector here. The vector that goes from the starting position to the ending position as the crow flies. <laughs> Now, your gut's telling you what you want to call that. This is the vector that I have to add to my initial position in the morning to get my final position at night. This is the change that gets added during the day. And so I want to label that as a delta R, where it's what I add to the initial to get the final. Now we give that a name, we call it the displacement. And I want to point out two important things about that displacement. First of all, it's very, very different than the distance traveled. If this is the wander that you did in the woods, 
the displacement vector is as the crow flies. If I were to start right here and go all the way around the Earth as fast as I could and come back right here, my displacement would be zero. My distance traveled would be a, a huge number. Okay, so very different concepts. The second idea is that if I had chosen my origin over here, some of these vectors would change, some not. What about these position vectors? Would they be different? Yes. yes. They would, because now they'd be starting at some origin over here. But the, the displacement vector would be exactly the same regardless of what I choose for my origin. That's important because these position vectors here are geography. We teach that in a different building. Okay, they're totally dependent on my coordinate system. This vector here, the displacement vector, is what we build all of kinematics on. And then on top of that we put dynamics, we call that mechanics, and that's the foundation for physics. Okay, it's all built on that vector right there. And it's independent of the coordinate system. Okay, we're going to be using that a lot. Now, I have a truck here that I claim exercises or produces uniform motion. Oh, come on, you can do better than that. I can't. Okay, <laughs> yeah, it's sort of uniform. Now, I claim that was uniform motion. With your neighbor, with only a meter stick and a Mickey, develop an operational definition by which you could determine whether that was uniform motion. In other words, come up with a, an operational definition of uniform motion with a meter stick and a mickey that you could measure against that that you just saw. Talk to your neighbor. What would you do? Yes, sir. Okay. So what you would do is you would look for equal intervals of time and see how far it goes during those equal intervals of time. And if those are equal intervals of distance, you'd say that's probably uniform. Now, if my time intervals are fairly large, I could actually have this thing speeding up and slowing down as it went along. So the smaller I get these time intervals, the more sure I am that I've got uniform motion here. Okay? So uh, that's pretty, pretty easy. Here's an example of uniform motion. What is that? Yes, that's the moon. I meant this other thing. <laughs> Wally. -E. No, that's not Wally. -E. What is it? No. Nope. International Space Station. Okay, that's filled with Russians. <laughs> okay. But you can see that this is a strobe photograph, and you can see that with equal intervals of time, we're covering equal uh, distances. Okay? Now, what if I took the number 60 and divided it by the number 15, getting the number 4? What does that number 4 tell me about this motion? What interpretation can you give this number 4, sir? 4 centimeters per second. 4 centimeters per second. Per second. Uh, I would pronounce it a little differently. 4 centimeters for each second. 
Okay, it's how far this, this truck is getting down the road for each one interval of time. Thank you. Okay, now its name, its name would be the velocity. But the name and the interpretation are very different things. Okay, now, the operational definition of velocity is very simple once we've operationally defined displacement. All we have to do is take our operational definition of displacement, delta r, and divide it by how many seconds on our mickey it took to make that displacement. <coughs> now it turns out that we have three flavors of velocity, uniform, average, and instantaneous. And I hope today to be able to talk about all three of those flavors. Now folks, I'm waiting for Friday, okay? On Friday, all of you will have been through that first tutorial, when Don Gates los. Then I'm just gonna take off. We're gonna build on that experience. But today, I'm just kind of treading water to get us, get us to Friday. Okay, let's talk about uniform velocity. Uniform velocity looks like that. And let's talk about graphing uniform velocity. Now folks, my experience has been that many of you, I mean, you look at a, a, a velocity versus time graph or a position versus time graph, and it just speaks to your soul. They just, they just talk to you. Others of you are scared to death of them. And so I, I, I apologize to those of you that already uh, can do this. We're gonna just try to help the rest of the class, okay? You wanna see a graph as a collection of data points. If I'm plotting position versus time, and time will always be the horizontal axis on these motion graphs, what I want to do is I want to look for data points. At t equals zero, the cart or the truck is at position zero. So I put a data point. At time equals zero, it's at position zero. And then I wait 15 seconds and it's gone 60 centimeters. So I go up 15 seconds, I go up 60 centimeters, I put a point, I hope you're bored. I then wait 15 more seconds, I do it again. When I connect the dots, I'm being arrogant. What I'm saying by connecting the dots is that if I wanted to, if I had no social life at all, I could have collected a million data points. And if I had put all million of those data points on there with red ink, they would have blurred together into that line. So whenever you see a, a motion graph, you want to see the red line as a bunch of red dots that are smeared together. Each red dot being a, a data point. So like right here, at t equals 10 seconds, I would be at 40 centimeters. A bunch of data points. Again, everyone, most everyone already knows that. What if I just give you that plot and I ask you, what's the velocity of the truck? How would you get it from that plot? The slope of the line. The slope of the line. Yeah, you just take the slope of the line, which is just the rise over the run. Now, in order to take the slope, you have to, you have to, you have to have two data points. You take any two points on the line, and you compute the rise, in this case, it would be 100 minus 40, or 60. You compute the run. In this case, it would be 25 minus 10, or 15. You divide the rise by the run, and you get the slope. In this case, it would be 4 centimeters for each second. Now, we're going to do something completely different. I'm going to look around the room, and I'm going to find everything I can that is circular. Everything that I find, I'm going to measure the circumference and the radius. And I'm going to do this with all sorts of objects. I will then plot them on a graph, where the vertical axis is circumference, the horizontal one is radius. I find to my delight that all of my objects in the room that are circular lie on a single straight line graph, where the slope of that graph is 2 pi, 6.28, six and change. 
What does that slope tell you about circles? What does 6.28 tell you about circles? Talk to your neighbor, please. Before I let you answer that, we're going to do a little thought experiment. Suppose that I go down to the hardware store, Ace Hardware, and I buy a lot of red rope, and I tie that snugly around the earth. Now, to make this a little simpler, let's suppose that the earth is perfectly spherical, and that the seas are frozen so that it doesn't, you know, get soggy and sink to the bottom of the ocean. So this is snugged up around the earth, and then I go back to the hardware store, and I buy an extra 20 feet of rope. I splice that extra 20 feet in, and all the people of the world stand shoulder to, the sh shoulder, to shoulder along the rope. We all bend down, and we lift together the same amount. So everywhere around the earth, this rope is the same distance above the ground. Now, what's the smallest thing that could fit under this rope? Would it be an amoeba, a bumblebee, a cat, or a dinosaur? With your clicker, people. What is the smallest thing that could fit under this rope? An extra 20 feet. We add 20 feet of rope, splice it in, and we all lift the same amount. We are the world. <laughs> we are the children. Okay, last call. Okay, an amoeba. <laughs> I don't usually do this, but with the 10 people that said a dinosaur, please raise your hand. <laughs> okay, folks. We have to decide, are we going to let them stay in the class if they're not going to take it seriously? I mean, uh, uh, the answer, people, is a dinosaur. Yes, those 10 people got it right. And the rest of you are wondering, how can that be? 20 feet is negligible compared to the distance around the Earth. It's got to be an amoeba. It can't be a dinosaur. It's a dinosaur. <laughs> and the answer is tied up with the interpretation of this slope. The slope of that line is 6 pi. That means if I want to increase the radius of any circle, whether it's a big circle, small circle, any circle, if I want to increase the radius of that circle by one unit, let's say one foot, I have to increase my circumference by 6.28 feet. That means if I want to raise this rope up off the ground one foot, I have to add 6.28 feet of rope. Now 20 is three times six for large values of six. So that means that when we add 20 feet of rope, we're gonna be able to lift that rope three feet. And that's big enough for a dinosaur to get under. Not that kind of dinosaur. I'm talking about the, the one that got the fellow in the Jeep. Do <laughs> you remember? That was a scary movie. I, yeah. I, uh, I let my youngest son watch that when he was too young. It terrified him. Okay. Now, folks, here's the point. The slope is where all the science is. The slope is telling you how much change you have in this axis for every one unit change in the horizontal axis. Four meters down, or four centimeters down the road for every one second that ticks by. Now science in general, and physics in particular, 
is all about finding relationships between different variables. And when you find a, a straight line relationship between two variables, the next thing you're going to do is find that slope, because that's where the Nobel Prize is, okay? That's where the science is in. Now, let's talk about average velocity. If I tell you that at 5 o'clock I left home, at 6 p.m. I'm 60 miles away from home, how fast am I going at 5.30? How fast? Huh? 180 miles an hour. Except for those of you that have seen my car, you said, no, Greg, you weren't going 180 <laughs> miles an hour. But clearly, I could be stopped at a, at a stoplight. I could be parked someplace eating donuts, which seems more likely. Okay? Um, all we know is that in 60 minutes, I was able to cover 60 miles. What we know is that my average velocity during that hour was 60 miles an hour. Okay? Now, the operational definition for average velocity looks like the general definition for velocity. But with the caveat that delta t can be large, large enough that you can speed up, slow down, stop for a stop sign. Okay? It's just the total distance divided by the total time. This is the kind of velocity you want to use when you're trying to figure out how long it's going to take to Denver, uh, to get to Denver. You don't want your fastest speed or your slowest speed. You want your average speed, okay? Now, I like to think of average velocity in terms of this Aesop's fable. You remember the story where the, the turtle and the, and the bunny rabbit are having a race. The bunny rabbit, so much faster, gets way out in the lead, decides to take a nap. Uh, when the bunny wakes up, she sees that the turtle's just about to cross the finish line, so she speeds across, and they have a photo finish. What that means is that the average velocity of the bunny rabbit is the same as the uniform velocity of the tortoise. They both start and finish the race at the same time. They both cover the same displacement in the same amount of time. Now I like this interpretation because at our house we have two bunny rabbits, we have three box turtles, we have five frogs, we have two dogs, we have a million fish. It's a zoo, it's just a zoo. Okay, now question. If the bunny rabbit travels at a uniform 10 miles an hour for the first hour, and a uniform four miles an hour for the last two hours, what was the bunny rabbit's average velocity? Now, folks in tutorial, you're gonna find that we often use student discussions. There'll be student one arguing with student two. And over the course of the semester, you're gonna find out that, well, student one isn't right very often. Okay, student one is, well, student one. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna play the part of student one right now, okay? Well, 10 and four, if I take the average of 10 and four, that's 10 plus four is 14, divided by two, seven. The average velocity would be seven miles per hour. Why is that not only wrong, but sick and wrong? Because you didn't take into account the amount of time. Right, the, the bunny rabbit wasn't traveling those two different speeds for the same amount of time. And so what we have to use is the operational definition. The average velocity is going to be the change in position. If you're just going to the right or to the left, we use delta x. If you're just going up or down, we use delta y. Okay? It's the total displacement divided by the total, uh, total time. Now the total displacement uh, the bunny rabbit covers 10 miles in the first hour and 4 miles in the second hour plus 4 miles in the third hour and does that in 3 hours. So that's going to be 18 miles in 3 hours or 6 miles per hour. Okay, check that your neighbor's on the bus with that. Not rocket science. We're going to do that in a month.
Okay, philosophical question. This is a picture taken by the late, great Doc Edgerton. My question is, does that bullet have a velocity at the instant shown in that picture? Talk to your neighbor. Does that bullet, yes or no, have a velocity at the instant shown in that picture? If we were to vote, some of you would say yes, some no. Let me ask it a different way. Suppose that this bullet had a speedometer, a speedometer, just right in the side of it. When Doc Edgerton took this picture, would the reading on that speedometer be zero or something different? Something different, okay? And that something on the speedometer we call the instantaneous velocity. Actually, it would be the instantaneous speed. When you combine it with the direction, it becomes the instantaneous velocity. Now, Doc Edgerton, how many of you have heard of Doc Edgerton before? Okay. Doc Edgerton is not, not a real doctor. Well, he's, he's dead, but when he was alive, he was not a real doctor. He dropped out of MIT. He dropped out of his graduate program, and that makes him way smarter than me. Because when you sign up as a grad student at MIT, you sign a legal document that states that if you come up with an earth-shaking idea that's going to revolutionize the world, that idea belongs to MIT. So if you come up with an idea late at night with two of your friends, what you do the next morning is you go down to the registrar's office and you drop out. Around Boston, there's a Route 128 that's just littered with high-tech companies that were started up by, by dropouts from MIT. They're the successful ones. Those of us that ended up graduating, we, we, we didn't have any ideas. We, just, <laughs> we couldn't think of anything. <laughs> now, Doc Edgerton, late at night, came up with the idea of the strobe. Uh, with two of his friends. The next day they dropped out of MIT and they started up the company eg and &G. He's called Doc Edgerton because his, his company was huge. They created a lot of the technology that helped us uh, win the war, Second World War. Now, um, Doc Edgerton took that money and built some of the most beautiful buildings on MIT's campus. In exchange, they gave him an honorary doctorate. They also gave him a big, huge lab on the third floor of the Infinite Corridor for him to do his research. Now, the Infinite Corridor, this is not going to be on the exam, but the oldest building on MIT is a great big, long hallway called the Infinite Corridor. And it's set up such that on the solstice, when the sun sets, it shines right down the corridor. So on those solstice, the MIT students, they line up on both sides and they watch the sun set and shine up. That's their religion. That's a geek religion, okay? <laughs> geek religion. Anyway, um, this is Doc Edgerton. I was hurrying down that infinite corridor. I was late for a physics class one day, and suddenly we heard Doc Edgerton's booming voice. Everyone stand still. I'm turning off the lights. Boom, it was dark. And we all had to just sit there in the dark because he was dropping milk drops down this, uh, this staircase from the third floor and uh, making this picture of the crown of milk. And so anyway, uh, these are some of the pictures that Doc Edgerton has made with his stroke. Quick other story. I have a younger brother who became a corporate lawyer for pharma Pfizer Pharmaceutical. A millionaire, very, very rich. Anyway, he came to visit me at MIT wearing his standard lawyer three piece pimp suit. Anyway, <laughs> he looked the lawyer part. And I took him up to uh, Doc Edgerton's uh, lab on the third floor of the Infinite Corridor. And Doc Edgerton had the most wonderful displays. And you push the button, and all these waterfalls came out, and the strobe came on, and the water went back. It was just amazing. 
And my brother was way out of his comfort zone, and he was, he was just afraid to, to admit that he didn't understand. So he was just going down this hall looking at the different uh, cases. And all of a sudden I heard Doc Edgerton's booming voice, Did you push the button? You can't learn anything unless you push the button. And the next thing I know, Doc Edgerton had his arm around my brother, and he was dragging him from display case to display case, teaching him physics. <laughs> and that's my happy place. <laughs> that's where I go. <laughs> uh, did you push the button? It's instantaneous velocity. The operational definition... Oh, well, before we go there, let's ask this question. What is the velocity of this truck, this truck that's speeding up? That's an ill-posed question. It has no answer. I have to be more specific. What's the velocity of that truck, say, at noon, or at t equals two seconds after noon? If I were to plot the position versus time for that truck, it wouldn't be a straight-line graph. A straight-line graph is uniform motion. It would be a curved graph. Now, if I wanted the velocity from that graph at t equals two seconds, what would I do? What did your math teacher teach you? Take the derivative, not that math teacher, okay? <laughs> We're not gonna do calculus here, even if you want to. You can look at the two on the graph and you go up. Okay, go up there, and what do I do then? Then you go over and see what number. For the mm, that's just gonna give me the position, not the speed. What would I do? Draw a tangent. Draw a tangent line, and once I draw that tangent line, what do I do? Find the slope. I pick any two points on that tangent line, and I compute the rise over the run, and that's going to give me the instantaneous velocity. Isn't that technically the derivative is the slope of the tangent line? It is. The, the derivative is the slope of the tangent line, but I have taken an oath, a sacred oath, that in order to not violate some of these people's expectations, I will not mention the word derivative or the word integral in this class. I've already violated that now three times. Okay, I'm gonna owe someone three dollars. Yes. Does that mean we can't use them? Oh, you can, I just can't. Yeah. Now, folks, even those of you that know calculus, why is it that the slope of that tangent line is going to give me the instantaneous velocity. And to help you see that, hold on, I'm going to ask us to zoom in on that graph. If I look at that graph just from one and a half seconds to two and a half seconds, looks like that. Well, that's not as curved as it used to be. If I go in even closer from 1.9 seconds to 2.1 seconds and blow it up, pow! Well, that's straight. If you don't think it's straight, I can go in closer. But I think that's straight. Now I know what a straight position versus time graph means. It means uniform motion. Is that truck speeding up or not? That graph is straight, suggesting that it's got uniform motion. But I thought the truck was speeding up. Help me out. Yes? Over that time interval. No matter how much you spend on a sports car, you will never be able to go from zero to 60 miles an hour in zero seconds. It takes time to speed up or slow down. In this case, we have not given it enough time to do much speeding up. And so as a consequence, it looks like uniform motion. Now, any time I have a straight line graph, I can take the slope of it. The slope of that graph happens to be four meters per second. Now, I ask you, is this truck gonna go four meters in the next second? No. So what interpretation can I give this slope? What does four meters per second tell me about this this truck. It's moving four meters per second at time t. At that time. 
And if you were to look down at the dashboard at the speedometer, and you happen to have a speedometer that read in meters per second, that's what you would see, is four. Now there's another interpretation for that number, a little more complicated than the one that this gentleman just gave, that contains some waffle words. Listen for them. Four is the number of meters that this truck would go down the road if it kept going at this speed for one whole second. That's not as satisfying, is it? All those waffle words. I would like you to use his definition. If, at t equals two seconds, you were to look down at the speedometer, that's what you would see, okay? Now, if I take that straight line graph and I extend it in both directions forever, and then zoom out to my original graph, what I see is that this red line is the extension of the straight line graph right there next to t equals two seconds. And that's why I can find the slope of that line anywhere on the line, and it will give me the instantaneous velocity at two seconds. Would you please do a buddy check and see if, uh, if your neighbor's still on the bus? Let's not lose anyone here. <laughs> Okay. Consider this statement. Delta X over delta T gives you the velocity for an interval of time, delta T. If we want the velocity at just one instant, one T, we would divide the position, the X at that instant, by the time at that instant, we would just take x over t. Is that wrong or is that sick and wrong? Or is it right? It's hard to prove something right. But it's really, really easy to prove something wrong. All you need is one counterexample. Suppose I were to tell you it's 12 noon and I'm in Butte. How fast am I going? Butte is a position, it's an X. 12 noon is a time, it's a T. If this were true, my velocity would be Butte over noon. <laughs> I'm not sure how fast that is, but I'm sure it's ugly. <laughs> oh, do some of you live there? It's still ugly. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> you should move. <laughs> My kids would always say, if there's going to be a nuclear war, we're going to view. It looks like it's already been hit. <laughs> I'm sorry. We love those. Okay. Now, the, the point is, you have to have an interval of time. Okay? You can't just take one instant. Um, there's a big difference between a change in a quantity and the quantity itself. If I want to know what the weather's like, I stick my head out the window. If I want to know how the weather is changing, I've got to stick my head out the window, I've got to pull it back in. In Montana, I've got to wait five minutes, then I've got to stick my head out a second time. I always have to have two data points. So the operational definition of instantaneous velocity still involves an interval of time. It's just that that interval of time has to be small. Well, how small is small enough? Smaller than a bread box? How small? Small enough for a straight line. Small enough that the graph is a straight line. Now, these calculus people over here, they'll just say, well, take the limit as delta t goes to zero. Yeah, fine, you can do that. All we really have to do is get small enough so that the position versus time graph looks straight. In regular words, that just means small enough that it didn't have time to speed up or slow down. That's all. That's all. Now, I have here, as a little exercise, I have here a ramp that is two meters long. 
And I have a cart here. And when I let go of the cart, it speeds up down the ramp. One one thousand, two one thousand, three one thousand. It takes exactly three seconds, exactly three seconds to get down the ramp. Now, if I take that distance of two meters and I divide it by the time of three seconds, I get a velocity. But I have three flavors of velocity. What flavor might this be? Average. Average. Three seconds is enough time for this thing to speed up. We saw it speed up. So this is an average velocity. Now, suppose that this car had a speedometer right on the side. That speedometer would start with a reading of zero, and as it went down the, down the ramp, the reading would increase. At some point on the ramp, that speedometer is going to have a reading of 0.67 meters per second. In other words, at some location, the average velocity and the instantaneous velocity will have the same value. Now my question is, where does that happen? Does it happen halfway down the, the ramp? Does it happen somewhere in the top half of the ramp? Or does it happen somewhere in the bottom half of the ramp? Now, um, we're gonna vote, either A, B, or C. Talk to your neighbor first and tell your neighbor what you're gonna vote and try to convince your neighbor to vote with you. with your clicker. Where will the cart be when the instantaneous velocity on the speedometer is 0.67 meters per second, the average velocity for the whole journey? There's more than 94 of us. Come on. Okay, 96. Is that it? Okay. The answer is not A. Okay? The answer is B, at the top half of the ramp. We'll talk about that on Friday, people. See you then.